Hello, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Illinois Learn to Hunt Turkey Hunting 101. Uh, this we're going to cover a lot of the basics of turkey hunting. We're also going to do a deep dive into regulations. We'll also talk about some turkey ecology and some strategies towards the end. So just some quick reminders. Ah, there we go. Um, before we get started, if this is your first webinar you've had with us, uh, your microphones and your webcams are disabled. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation as we work through it. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you can ask the presenters through the Q&A window, and we will answer them either live through the presenter or one of the presenters can answer it in the chat. So keep an eye on that as we're working through the presentation. You will also have time at the end if you have any leftover questions for uh, any questions you may have about hunting turkey or anything in Illinois, please ask us those at the end. We'll stick around and answer all the questions you may have. Uh, feel free to also use the chat window if you want to communicate to each other uh, or chat about what's going on in the presentation. Just another reminder that you will be emailed a copy of this PowerPoint, um, some informative handouts, a YouTube link to a recording of this webinar, as well as a survey uh, for feedback and that feedback helps us curtail the presentations that we have and the different courses that we give and also helps us kind of back up what we're looking at with the DNR. So if you answer any of those questions that we have on that survey, uh, we can then take those and show them the DNR uh, and try to kind of lobby for change, changes to help new hunters or existing hunters uh, have a better experience in the state. So just take a few minutes to fill those out. Uh, there is a link to that survey in, <laughs> excuse me, in the chat. So if you haven't seen that yet in the chat window, uh, you can follow that link. Our presenters tonight, we have Adam. Adam, would you like to say hi real quick? How's it going, everyone? Thanks for joining us tonight. Or Curtis. Good evening, everybody. I, hello, are we there? Did you guys not hear me? Yep, I heard you, Adam. Okay. I thought it worked. Just wanted to make sure. Hold yeah. On. Let's see if we... Hi, everyone, again. Give us one second here just to figure out the technical difficulties. One second, folks, and see if we can get these guys uh, unmuted here. You got us now. All right, can you guys hear us now? I uh, got you loud and clear. Okay, do we got Jason back? All right, looks like Jason switching out his headphones. One second, folks. All right, so our course outline today while Jason figures his headphone situation out. So we're going to be talking about how hunters are conservationists. We're going to be talking about wild turkey ecology, which Curtis is going to do a pretty good deep dive into that. Uh, we're going to talk about all the regulations. We're going to try to keep those as basic as possible so you guys can understand them, but there's quite a bit of them. Uh, we're going to cover land access, scouting techniques, and then decoy strategies. And if you guys join us this Thursday, we have Turkey 102, uh, which gives a quick one-on-one -on -one review and then dives in a lot deeper and further into hunting tactics, scenarios, how to locate mid-morning times, and how to um, hunt with 
turkeys that are hand up or toms that are already have found their mate and they're kind of difficult in difficult situations to hunt. So we're going to be giving you all sorts of scenarios um, and it's going to be a lot more in depth about the hunting side of turkeys. So with that, Curtis, take it away. All right. So we always like to start off talking about how hunters are conservationists because um, it's one of the really great things about hunting. Um, kind of hunters put their, um, go back one second here. There we go. Hunters kind of put their, their money and their effort um, right back into basically the resources that they're trying to take. So one, um, a lot of people think that like general excise taxes cover conservation in North America, but that's really not the case. So when you go out and buy your, your pheasant stamps, your habitat stamps, all those sorts of things, put money right back into uh, state conservation and, and wildlife management. But then there's also this act called the Pittman-Robertson Act that uh, started in 1937. And this is an excise tax on firearms and ammunition and, and sporting uh, equipment. It's about 10 to 11 percent, and that happens at the manufacturer's level. So this isn't a tax that you, you know, if you walk into Cabela's and grab a, a box of shells, if you're <laughs> lucky enough to find one on the, sh on the shelf there, um, you're not going to have that extra excise tax at that time. That's already been paid um, at the manufacturer level. So built in there but yeah it's awesome so that 10 to 11 percent from all this sporting equipment um, is basically earmarked to go right back into uh, wildlife conservation and that uh, is a benefit to animals that we hunt of course like pheasants and, and wild turkey like in this presentation um, but then also animals that are um, you know non-huntable all all the critters out there benefit um, due to this habitat work. So really cool. And then a portion of those funds also goes into um, ensuring that you have uh, shooting ranges and education to, to get started. Now we'll go into some turkey hunting lingo. So this is uh, when you're first getting started, you might hear some of these words and think, you know, what in the world is that? So just so you get a little background here, um, turkeys are an interesting critter. Little upland bird walking around there. Actually, Ben Franklin wanted it to be the national symbol, but um, you can see in that picture there in the left real clear and in the one that they're strutting there, uh, that long beard. So it looks like a beard. They look like hairs. They're actually modified feathers, of course, because it's a bird. Uh, but they do look like hares and in a in a long beard or in a tom, um, you know, that might be 10, 11, 12 inches long. Um, they grow about four to five inches per year, the beards. But once they get up to about 11 or 12, they start dragging on the ground and and breaking the tips off. So it's pretty tough to find one longer than that. Now, spurs, the beard, as far as utility for the turkey, um, we don't really know. Most people think it's it's strictly um, a sexual selection type thing, so it basically displays the fitness of the male. Um, but this next word here, spurs, these actually do have a purpose, and, and you'll be seeing this here real soon, uh, probably once this snow starts to melt. Um, these big flocks of turkeys, the toms are going to start having uh, their testosterone rolling and, and they're going to kind of stop tolerating each other's presence and at that point you're going to start to see see them fight and when they fight uh, they do so with their feet and they they're trying to hit each other with those spurs so um, that's a really good indication of how old the bird is because they don't um, typically wear like the beard does when they get old so um, hens will have a little a little nub there but Generally, it's just going to be your male turkeys that actually have a spur um, that they can fight with. And once they get up to about three years old or more, then you're talking about a, an inch long spur. And um, that's also something you want to keep in mind for after you shoot one uh, and you run up there to, to make sure it doesn't 
you know, flop away or anything, those spurs can still get you. So, so keep those in mind. Um, now the fan, you, you can see in this turkey picture in the far right, that bird's doing what's called strutting. Um, and so its tail feathers are spread out into that nice, beautiful fan. And um, again, that's uh, all a part of the, the male turkey trying to look real beautiful. So some hens, um, you know, think he's real fit and, and choose to, to breed with him. Um, now you've heard me use this word quite a bit already. Tom is generally what we're going to call a mature uh, bird. So a long beard, um, one with a swinging beard like the two turkeys on the end. Um, these two in pictures. Now a Jake, a Jake is, is also a male turkey, but these, um, you know, their beard doesn't quite swing yet. So a lot of times they're just going to be protruding straight out. Um, but you can, uh, you can still see they got that red and blue head and a lot of times they'll have a white crown and, and they'll still get excited and gobble and all that stuff. Just, they don't have the, the big swinging beard of the Toms. Um, and then hens, of course, are uh, what we call the females, which are not generally going to be uh, um, in something you can take. But the one exception is if you do see a bearded hen, then that is, um, you know, that's something you can take. I think they count for like 0.5% of the harvest. So pretty rare, um, you know, not very common. But if you do see a bearded hen, you, you can tag that just like a gobbler or a jake. Now, cool thing about turkeys too is we've got some different subspecies across the across the country here, and of course here in Illinois we just have uh, the eastern wild turkey, which is going to be the the most popular wild turkey in terms of number of hunters that go after them, and then also uh, the most numerous in the bag. Um, so, and this map I should point out is from the year 2000. So we're already talking about um, two decades old. Uh, this map has filled out since then. So Illinois, uh, just consider that whole thing blue. Uh, same thing pretty much with Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, a, um, a lot of these states and Iowa as well have filled in over the past 20 years um, as, as turkeys continue to be a real conservation success story. And, you know, we need to remember that around the turn of the century, around 1900, when we were just getting out of the extermination era and into what we call the era of conservation, there were fewer wild turkeys across the whole continent. Um, there was about the same number, 3,000, as what they figure there are polar bears today. So we've come a long way, uh, whereas I think today they figure there's about 200,000 in Illinois alone. So amazing conservation success story but if you want some diversity you can do a little bit of traveling and, and go after some of the national wild turkey federations got some uh, they call them slams so their grand slam is if you get an osceola turkey from florida an eastern turkey from somewhere here in the midwest you can get a rio grande in texas oklahoma up into kansas um, and then a Merriam, a Western turkey, they're kind of spread all across the, the West. Um, if you get all four of those, that's called a Grand Slam by the NWTF. And then if you add one more turkey onto that, which is the Goulds, which is a high elevation mountain turkey that does make it into Arizona and New Mexico. I was actually lucky enough to see a few in Arizona, which was pretty cool. Um, but you can hunt them in Mexico. If you add that one, you got a Royal Slam. And then if you make the big trek across the Yucatan Peninsula there and get into the oscillated turkey uh, realm, which is a really cool looking turkey, um, now you've got what they call the World Slam. So some cool little adventures that NWTF kind of encourages people to go on and, and go and see new things and, and harvest birds in new places. So um pretty fun little challenges that uh that lead to some adventures so i kind of mentioned this already this amazing conservation success story that is the wild turkey um habitat loss and unregulated take uh and and you know people are quick to call that hunting but of course, unregulated take, not all the birds that were shot were hunted. Sometimes it was just a farmer, 
you know, keeping them out of their corn or, you know, who knows what. But um, by 1910, there you basically couldn't find a turkey in Illinois. Um, and across the whole country, just had a small number of them. Um, now, reintroduction efforts began around 1959 and uh, continued for a long time, all the way up into the 2000s, where turkeys were brought from areas of Illinois where they were abundant and, and put in places where they needed to be recolonized. And that worked amazingly well. Um, and a lot of other states have done the same thing that Illinois has. And uh, of course, obviously we, we see the fruit of this today is um, over 100,000 wild turkeys in Illinois today in one state. So obviously a nice robust uh, population that allows us to go out there and, and harvest some. So let's talk about some key behavior and you see it there that uh, turkey sitting in the, the chair see, seeing if this one's better or that one's better. They've got excellent eyesight and um, you know if you if you get used to some of the turkeys you might see around town for those of you that live in urban areas with turkeys, you know that's a different beast than the turkeys you're going to hunt out there. Um, man, they can see just the smallest amount of movement. And I think personally, I, I spooked probably two or three turkeys uh, because I moved too much before I ever got one. And it was just, you know, I was used to getting away with a little bit of movement with deer and you can't hardly do that with turkeys. Um, <clears throat> but so another big thing, they, they breed during the spring. So that's why, that's when we hunt them. That's the prime hunting time. Uh, is the spring. It's a lot of fun, really interactive. You get the calling component. Um, so springtime is the, that's most turkey hunters favorite time to hunt them. You can also hunt during the fall, but you don't get that same, you know, gobbling and strutting and drumming and, and that real uh, awesome behaviors that you get to see in the spring breeding. Um, in the fall, it's all about feeding, like most critters, just trying to fatten up to survive the winter. Um, and uh, obviously not a lot of gobbling in the, in the fall, but in the spring, that uh, sure changes. Um, they're most active during the crepuscular hours, uh, especially when it's real hot or, uh, you know, once we get towards the late season. But obviously being turkeys, they are what we call diurnal. So they're active during the day, not at night, which the good news about that is for you deer hunters that get tired of um, all the deer switching to nocturnal activity and being hard to hunt. Well, turkeys can't really do that. So that's a that's one plus. I already talked about their eyesight, but they're not going to smell you. So if you go out into the woods a little bit smelly, uh, you might annoy your hunting buddy, but uh, you're probably not going to scare any turkeys and they can see color. They can actually see all the colors that we can and even into the UV spectrum. So uh, no blaze orange and, um, you know, it's it's uh, pre everywhere. People are warned against wearing any colors, obviously, that look like a turkey. So stay away from the reds and whites and blues and, and browns and blacks and things of that nature during the, the turkey season. Um, you know, just to make sure nobody nobody mistakes you. But um, also you don't want those bright colors because that'll make the, the turkey cue right in on you too. All right, so we need to make our identification unless if it's a bearded hen, we got to know it's a tom before we pull the trigger. Now, if it's a strutting bird with a big old long beard, that's real easy, right? That's that's a gobbler. We know we can take that. Um, but Jake's can be a little bit tougher. And what you really, um, my favorite, uh, I guess, identification feature is going to be the head really look for that bright red, blue, and white. I mean, that stands out in the woods. And when they get excited, like when you're calling, those colors are really going to pop. Um, and the hen, you know, more cryptic coloration, so she can she can guard the nest a little bit more. Um, her head's just kind of a light grayish blue, uh, real mute colors on there. And then if, if you're close enough, the males have a snood, um, 
which is kind of that wobbly bit that that hangs off their beak there but um and caruncles down below they got lots of uh, weird names for all those things but it's only the male that has those features um, the body itself is generally going to be bigger on the males and much darker colored as opposed to the the lighter colored females uh, beard can be on on both but like we mentioned before pretty rare on the hens um, gobblers are going to be the only ones that gobble and drum spit and drum um, so if you hear any of those you know you're good um, but uh, gobblers can also yelp uh, kind of like a hen so it's more of a coarse yelp but they can do it um, they strut obviously to get the attention and uh, and they're a little bit bigger so really look for that head that's that's the number one thing and then if there's any question definitely try to put all the pieces together and um, whatever you do be sure it is a gobbler before you before you touch that trigger Here's a, another little picture so you can kind of practice it in picture form here and, and this shows some jakes pretty good and you can see their beard there it's really hard to spot that. Um, all three of those in the in the top right picture are jakes you can tell by the the head the red and, and blue there. Um, but their beards are just barely sticking out so um, that that head really gives it away um, the hen on the other hand there at the left just look at how dull her head is um, and then her coloration overall in her body is going to be a little bit duller and a little bit smaller too but um, that's easiest to tell when they're in a group like that uh, lower right picture so you can kind of practice looking in there picking out some that are that are gobblers some that are hens and you might see a couple that you that you think are jakes but um, point is when you see a big flock like that uh, make sure you pick out a gobbler all to itself because, you know, remember, you're also shooting with a, a shotgun, right, that shoots a pattern. So I don't hardly see maybe that turkey on the far, far right, but um, you almost don't have a shot in this group because they're they're packed in there a little bit too tight. So definitely don't want to touch that trigger off and wind up with more than one bird flopping. So right now we're in the winter, obviously, if you if you forgot, just look outside. Um, they're still in really big flocks. Main priority is feeding, but this is going to switch real, real soon. As soon as insects and seeds start really popping, which is uh, it is uh, spring and summer, um, really the food smorgasbord that turkeys take advantage of the, the most. Once those start popping, then they're going to break up from those big old groups and they're going to all the hens are going to uh, select their nesting ground. The resources are going to be much more spread out. So now it's no longer advantageous to be in this big group going from big grain field to big grain field. Um, now they spread out. They've all got insects and seeds to eat. And, um, you know, the hens really drive that spreading out and it's the, the toms who uh, will start to fight with one another and you know, hopefully get to see this in the field here pretty soon if you're paying attention while you're driving, but then they'll start to, um, you know, uh, be thinking about breeding. And so they're gonna start um, really strutting and displaying and hoping that the hens uh, select to breed with them. And, um, you know, then they'll, they'll raise the, the nest in the location they've selected. Um, home, home ranges can shift for several miles. So if you have a spot that right now you're like, oh yeah, my, my field that I have permission on, there's 45 turkeys in it every night, I'm, I'm set for spring turkey season. Well, you might be, but um, just keep in mind that those turkeys do move their home ranges pretty substantially to take advantage of what resources are there. So here in another you know six weeks or so, all those 45 turkeys could be spread out and and uh, your field that was a really good place to hunt may may dry up so keep that in mind but the next slide we're getting into spring summer and so now we're talking about turkey seasons coming. Um, the toms are splitting up they're going to be fighting and uh, they're hoping to to draw in kind of the hens to to select them as the fittest and the, the best. Um, 
the, so smaller groups of hens will stick with the, the older toms. That's kind of like their harem there. And then, um, you know, throughout the spring and summer, turkeys are going to spend a lot of time in fields and, uh, you know, using the woods for covers. And they really, really like the, the grasses and grasses that are low enough for them to see. Uh, so they can avoid predators, but that's going to be where they're finding their seeds and really their insects. And um, if you are lucky enough to get a um, gobbler or jake this fall, you know, you can check out the crop and see what's in there. And most of the time it's going to be like 90% plus insects, a lot of grasshoppers. So they love the grass. And yeah, so I, I mentioned this a little bit, but basically if you find big mature trees, which is what they uh, prefer to roost in, um, you know, they don't like really early successional trees, but a big, nice mature tree, nice mature forest is going to give them their, their roost. And then if you have a lot of uh, grasses around, especially if it's a mix of like warm season grasses that you know, not like fescue that chokes them out so hard that the, the poults can't even run through it, but a nice mixed grass field where they can get all the insects and seeds to their, their little heart's desire. Uh, if you've got those two things going for you, you're probably going to have turkeys in the spring. Now I'm going to turn it over to Adam for the regs. Thank you. So what regs do you need to know? So we're going to talk about legal game license and permits, lottery application, legal methods of take, hunting seasons, and post-harvest procedures. So first off, here on the right is the cover of this past season's hunting digest reg regulation booklet. Uh, so super important piece of information, uh, has all the season dates for every type of game. Uh, you can find this online at the link here that we have on the screen. Uh, and you can also find paper copies at Walmart or sporting goods store, uh, Bass Pro, Cabela's, so on and so forth. Uh, so I always try to at least pick up a copy. If I can't find any, uh, I do like to download one to my computer and one to my phone. So I can always have it with me um, either at home if I need to look up something or if it's on my phone, I could be at the truck in the parking lot uh, if I need to double check something quickly. And it's nice because it's already downloaded. You don't need to access any Wi-Fi or service. So helps in those spots that are, um, you don't have very good service. So definitely I recommend doing that for sure. So moving on, uh, legal gain. So as Curtis mentioned, uh, Toms and Jakes are males. And then hens with visible beards are also legal during the spring season. Uh, so here we have another few pictures. Uh, on the left is going to be a full mature Tom. In the middle is a juvenile male, Jake. And then on the right, as you can see, kind of that bluish gray head, super drab colored. Uh, it is a hen, but it does have a beard. So those in the spring are, are, are legal game as well. In the fall season, uh, any turkey of any sex are legal to harvest. Uh, with a, during the fall gun season and archery season. So again, in the spring, you're going to mainly focus on the toms and jakes. And if you uh, come across a bearded hen, she is legal as well. So next, uh, the hunter education safety course. So anyone born on or after January 1st, 1980 has to complete the safety course. Uh, usually there are instructor-led online self-study with a field day course, or if you're over 18 or older, you can take the whole course online um, and get your certificate that way. Uh, we are not DNR, so we're not exactly sure when the uh, instructor-led courses are going to start up again, uh, but hopefully by uh, mid to late summer when everything kind of, you know, re returns back to normal and we're going to have uh, in-person things going on. But if you do it online, if you're 18 years or older, you could get it done in about a weekend. It takes a few hours, um, pretty simple reading. There's just kind of, there's about 10 chapters, I believe, uh, with quizzes and chapter tests. So uh, not very difficult, but it is time consuming. 
So up next, the FOID card or the Illinois Firearm Owners Identification Card. So regardless of who owns the firearm, uh, Illinois resident who has a firearm or ammunition in their possession must have a valid FOID card. FOID cards are issued by the Illinois State Police and not by IDNR. They have a 10 year expiration. Uh, and the nice thing is you do not need them for archery equipment. Uh, unfortunately, if you apply now, you most likely will not uh, be able to receive a FOID card in time for turkey season. Uh, they are pretty backed up uh, three plus months. Um, so if you want to hunt anything next season, like next fall, I would definitely recommend to do this application as soon as possible. Um, you could still try for turkey season. There's just no, of course, no promises that you guys will receive it in time for the season. Uh, but then again, the nice thing is you are able to use archery for turkey as well. So just keep that in mind. So the licenses and permits that you need to hunt turkeys, you're gonna need your base hunting license, a state habitat stamp, and then of course a turkey permit. And when you get uh, your permit, whether it's in the mail or over the counter, um, make sure to sign those right away and as well sign your base hunting license. Uh, your signature does need to be on both for them to be valid. So turkey permit types. So there's a few different types of uh, permits that you guys are going to be able to apply for. Uh, we will go over the lottery uh, here in the next few slides. But the main ones you guys are going to see are the special hunt areas. So those are tags that are uh, used for specific Illinois DNR hunting sites. Um, so DNR ground, you're going to need specific tags that say that name of that piece of property uh, for one turkey or for one turkey for whatever season that you choose. Landowner tags are permits available for um, individuals who own land in Illinois. County tags, uh, you're going to be able to get these over the lottery or whatever are left over, you're going to be able to get them over the counter. These are primarily for hunting private land, um, but you are able to use county permits in non-Illinois DNR land, for example, the Shawnee National Forest. Uh, so you'd have to get by a tag for whatever county you plan on hunting where the forest is located. Um, and then there are a few Illinois DNR sites that you are able to hunt with a county permit, uh, but there are not many in the state. So make sure to be aware of that. Go on to the next slide. So to understand what tags you need, if you go to the back of the, uh, the hunting and trapping regulations booklet, uh, there is a section where it says uh, public area hunting. It's usually, yes, it's the last section there. You guys can see it in the parentheses. But here's basically a chart of all the IDNR hunting lands and what kind of permits you need for each season. So if you go to the next slide, I believe it's highlighted. So here for Turkey Spring, as you guys can see, um, the C stands for the county permits and S stands for special hunt permits. So most of them, as you see, are gonna be uh, the special hunt permits. There are a few uh, parks or DNR hunting lands that allow you to use county permits, but very few of them. So just double check that. Of course, this is free on that uh, link. And if you download it to your computer, you guys are able to study that and make sure you have everything correct. <laughs> So moving on to the lotteries. So you must apply for certain permits by the specified day to be able to hunt. So if you guys look at the chart here that's highlighted, there are three main lotteries. Um, the first one opens October 6th. Uh, the last one just ended here a few, days, uh, a few days ago. So if you guys did not apply during a lottery, uh, you're gonna have to rely on whatever tags are left over the counter. And as you guys can see, those go on sale March 9th. So anything that didn't get uh, bought up during the lottery, 
uh, is going to go on sale over the counter, which means you'd have to go to uh, Walmart or anywhere that, you know, there's vendors for hunting licenses to, to be able to purchase that. So you can apply as a group for some permits. Also, uh, you're not guaranteed a permit, but will most likely get one if you apply during the lotteries. Um, and then again, make sure to pick uh, your county permits versus site specific permits, depending on where you want to hunt. So basically what it looks like when you log into the screen, there's 10 blank choices and you can fill out one to 10, uh, depending on how many tags or you know, what tags you wanna get. Uh, of course, each lottery will only give you one of those choices if you do get drawn, uh, but you have 10 options in each lottery. So uh, you can fill out the different dates and so on and so forth for different spots. Uh, so you can mix and match and try to, try to get one and get lucky to, to get one during the lottery. So moving on to Illinois DNR Hunter fact sheets. So right here is a screenshot on the right of what a fact sheet looks like. Uh, basically each DNR site has a fact sheet uh, where it shows you all the information for the site. It'll again confirm which permit is required for spring turkey hunting. Uh, it'll tell you all the other rules and regulations for that site. Each site is a little bit different. Um, so make sure to study these and understand the rules and regs for each site you plan on hunting, regardless for turkey hunting, deer hunting, pheasant hunting, so on. Um, all the rules are listed on this for that site. Uh, whether there's special check-in, check-out procedures, if you need a windshield card, uh, even if you need non-toxic shots. So uh, make sure to find these for your site and make sure to read those and understand. So bag limits for turkey season, uh, for each tag, you can either shoot one Tom, Jake, or bearded hen per permit, and you have a maximum of three permits during the spring. Moving on to season dates. So Illinois turkey season is divided into five segments. Uh, some people call them five seasons. So if you hear somebody say that, uh, don't get confused. That's just uh, what some people call them. But basically you have two uh, sections. You have the North zone and the South zone. Um, and the first segment in the South zone starts April 5th. First segment in the North zone starts uh, April 12th. So they're about in the South zone is about a week earlier, uh, starts a week earlier and then ends about a week earlier. Um, so for turkey hunting, your hours are going to be half an hour before sunrise till 1 p.m. every day of each segment. Uh, you cannot hunt past 1 p.m. That is illegal. Um, so make sure uh, that when the clock hits 1 p.m. to take the shells out of your gun or put your arrow back in your quiver. Uh, to signal that you are done hunting, you know, especially when you're walking back towards your vehicle. So legal methods of take to hunt turkeys in Illinois, shotguns and archery equipment are the only legal method of take that may be used. Uh, so here in the top right corner, we kind of have a chart of four types of guns. You have your, I'll just go over the pros and cons quickly of each. Uh, so you're over and under and side by side are fairly similar. Uh, the only difference is the over under your barrels are stacked versus the side by side they're next to each other. Um, here with those, I'll go over the pros and cons to, for turkey hunting. So the cons for these for turkey hunting is that you do only have two shells. Um, turkeys, there's all sorts of stories that you will hear once you start diving into turkey hunting. People miss every year. It's just something that happens during turkey hunting. Um, so if it happens to you, don't worry, everyone's been there. But so the one thing with these is you have one less shell versus a pump action or an auto loader. Um, nice thing with those is if you find older ones that are used, they're fairly decent price. If you look at newer ones, uh, they tend to be a little bit more fancier and kind of uh, higher priced. So if you are looking to just turkey hunt, um, I'd probably recommend to stick with a pump action or auto loader 
uh, pump action is my go-to gun for just about any kind of hunting, just because they're so versatile. Um, they can usually take all sorts of lengths of shells um, and different loads for turkey to goose hunting, anything in between. Um, and there's plenty of pump actions on the market, new and used uh, for fairly cheap prices. Um, and, you know, if this is a gun, for example, your Remington 870, uh, everybody uh, could probably pick that out out of a picture. Um, you know, you can throw them in the mud and they'll be okay to run the next day. So um, definitely look into something like that. If you're a newer shooter and you're a little bit more timid with guns, an auto loader might be a good option um, just because when you shoot, it has a lot less recoil due to the fact of the way it loads the ammunition into the chamber. Uh, it uses all the gases um, when it, the spring gets pushed back, which softens the blow to your shoulder. So a uh, 20 gauge auto loader would have a really uh, low recoil for somebody who's you know smaller built or a little bit uh, timid with guns or not used to shooting. So there's pros and cons of each. Of course, do your research before you buy a firearm, but those are just kind of the quick few that come to mind. So some shotgun regulations. So shotguns uh, between 10 gauge to 20 gauge are legal to use. 410 and 28 gauge are not legal for Turkey and Illinois. Your shotgun must only be capable of holding three shells. Um, if your shotgun has the capacity to hold more than three shells, uh, you must add a plug to the magazine tube to ensure it can only hold three. Uh, we cannot stress that enough. That's a big rule. You really don't want to uh, break that rule. Here in the picture, this green rod is what a plug is. So basically it's plastic um, that just blocks you from being able to hold more than three shells in your magazine tube. Um, that's just the, the way the rule is written. You can only have three. So that would be one in the chamber and two underneath um, in the magazine. Number four shot is the largest shot that may be used for turkey hunting. So if you guys have any questions on how to choose the proper ammunition, um, or if you wanna understand what all the numbers mean on a box of shotgun shells, please check out our video. Link is here in the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you just go, if you just uh, go to YouTube and type in Illinois Learn to Hunt, it'll take you to our page. We have a bunch of information on there, uh, but uh, one of our colleagues put this video together, quick 10 minute video, and it, it's really informative and everyone should take a watch. So choke tube basics and selections. Uh, so choke tubes can be screwed into the muzzle to change shot spread. Uh, usually for turkey hunting, you're gonna be looking at full chokes and extra full chokes uh, just because they keep the shot a lot tighter at further distances. Um, here in the bottom right, this is what a choke tube looks like. That's all kinds of different uh, options there and variations. And basically it's a picture to the left. You can see they just screw into the, the muzzle of the gun and sit inside there. Sometimes there's some turkey chokes that stick out a little bit, um, just depends on which one you, you purchase and what kind of gun you have as well. In the chart above, you can take a look quickly. It just shows you what your stand. So these four are kind of your standard chokes that um, that you see in most guns that come with chokes. Uh, you just have your cylinder choke, uh, improved cylinder choke, modified, and then your full. Um, so you can see at the top you have a 40 inch spread at 25 yards with the cylinder choke. So that would be good for something that uh, you're hunting close up, like squirrels or anything like that. Um, has a far spread, uh, not, you know, many BBs are going to hit what you're trying to, to um, harvest. Whereas if you go to full, you have a 40 inch spread at about 40 yards. So you have a lot more uh, range. It's harder to hit things just because if they're close, uh, there's not as much spread of the BBs. So there's pros and cons to them all. But for turkey hunting, you're going to be looking at full or extra full. And there's all sorts of ones that go past full so uh, special turkey chokes that goes past full so um, yeah that's what you're going to be looking at if you guys dive into that you'll see all sorts of options um, out there on the market 
for some post-harvest regulations. You must attach the lag tag securely right after you harvest the animal. Uh, the tag must remain attached until the turkey's uh, at the legal residence of the hunter. You must register the turkey by 10 p.m. of the day of the harvest. And you may not butcher a turkey until it has been registered. So a few rules there, um, make sure to follow those properly to avoid any uh, issues, um, but pretty simple. Some more regulations. So blaze orange or pink is not required for turkey hunting. Uh, it is recommended to carry a blaze orange or pink hat with you uh, or something to wrap your bird once you harvest it and you're transporting it out of the field. Um, I know some people who carry just a hat in their pack just so that they wear some orange while they're moving around, not when they're interacting with the turkeys, but you know, on the way or out of their hunting spot. Um, some of the cool turkey hunting vests and stuff that they make these days have uh, a little bit of orange or pink fabric uh, that's in a little pocket that you could take out and it hangs on your back. Um, so just make sure you have something with you that when you do harvest a bird, um, you know, somebody doesn't mistake you for a big walking turkey. So that's just a courtesy to everyone else and also it keeps you safe. With the miscellaneous turkey regulations, Electronic calls may not be used. You may not harvest wild turkeys by the use or aid of bait. No calling that imitates a turkey. Uh, this does not apply to locator calls, um, but you cannot use any specific turkey sounding calls um, from March 15th through the day before the season in the South Zone and March 22nd through the day before the season in the North Zone. Um, and you cannot legally shoot a wild turkey while it is in a tree before 7 a.m. So again, just to kind of clarify the, the calling, you can, if you want to go scout turkeys before the season, you are able to use locator calls, but you cannot use uh, a box call, pot call, diaphragm, mouth call to make turkey noises. It has to be something else like an owl hoot uh, or something of that nature, crow call, something like that. So shot placement, uh, when you're hunting with a shotgun, so you're going to want to aim for the head and neck. Uh, several pellets in the vital area will mean a quick and ethical kill. If you aim at just the head, much of your pattern will go above the target. Uh, and patterning ensures you know how your shotgun ammunition and choke to perform. So we're about to get into patterning after this slide, I believe. But kind of the rule of thumb that I tell all uh, new turkey hunters is that you want to aim at where the neck meets the feathers. So kind of where that red um, of their neck, part of their neck and the feathers meet, right? Yep, where the arrow is. That's my favorite place to aim uh, just because if anything freaky happens, you know, the Tom drops his head a little bit, you still have a really good chance of, um, you know, getting some BBs into the effective area. Uh, whereas if you aim kind of where its eye is, like it says, most of your pattern is going to fly straight above its head. Um, and, you know, you might unfortunately wound the bird or um, miss it completely. So aiming a little bit lower, if you aim right there where the feathers start, it ensures that you protect the meat and don't get a lot of pellets in the meat. Um, and it ensures that you don't miss. So that's kind of the rule of thumb there. So patterning your shotgun, it is best to pattern your shotgun before the season to find its effective range. Uh, use the same shells and shot size you plan to use during the season. Uh, shoot at various distances, 10, 20, 30, 40, to ensure your pattern is sufficient for an ethical harvest. Again, number four shot is the largest that you may use for turkey hunting. It's a pretty cool chart here on the bottom, um, just showing you what the shot the actual shot size of the BB looks like compared to the number. Uh, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, the smaller the number, the bigger the shot size is. So kind of just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, my favorite ammunition to use um, for turkey hunting uh, is a, something with a 
shot number five, I think is the best all around shot size for turkey hunting. Um, four, you have a little bit um, bigger shot size pellets, which means that there's lots of them in the actual shell. Uh, and, you know, so it might not give you the best pattern out of your gun. Whereas six, sixes are still uh, really common as well, um, but you have smaller shot sizes there. So there's more of them, but they don't pack as many, uh, as big of a punch at further distances. So I have found that five is kind of the, the best medium there. Um, of course, do your homework, do your research, and each gun uh, shoots differently with all sorts of ammo. Uh, so it took me a while to find um, what shells and choke combination worked best for my gun, but there's all sorts of information on that on the interwebs. Um, so do a little bit of research and it can kind of turn into a preseason project and you can kind of mess around with different uh, ammunition and, and so on. But what a good pattern looks like is on the picture here on the right, you want a nice and even spread of your BBs. You don't want it to be spotty and have a bunch of BBs on the left or right. Um, you want a nice even spread uh, to where as if, you know, you aim right at the the neck there where the feathers and the head meet, you know, you'd have a nice concentration all throughout there um, and it would lead to an ethical and quick kill. So some archery related regulations. Legal vertical bow types are recurved long or compound bows with a minimum pull of 30 pounds at some point within a 28 inch draw. Minimum arrow length for all vertical bow types is 20 inches. That does not include the point. To use a crossbow, it must have a minimum draw weight of 125 pounds, minimum overall length of 24 inches, a working safety, and used with fletched bolts or arrows of not less than 14 inches, not including the point as well. Broadheads must be used for archery turkey hunting. Broadheads may have fixed blades and they must be metal or flint chert or obsidian napped or expandable blades uh, that must be metal as well. Broadheads have to have a minimum of seven eighths inch diameter when fully opened. All other bow and arrows, including electronic arrow tracking systems utilizing radio telemetry are illegal to use. Again, all of this is in the Hunter Digest. Um, so if you guys, you know, need to read more about it, it's all in that booklet uh, where you guys can, can read that and study that as well. And moving on to shot placement for archery, uh, turkey's appearance changes significantly at full strut and can make pinpointing their vitals a challenge. So we're gonna start at the top left and this one applies for, um, shotguns as well as archery. Um, so uh, again, I always tell people to aim where the feathers and the neck meet there. Um, and the second rule I always tell them is you make sure you shoot when the palm is not in full strut. You want him to look like the bird on the top left with his head fully up um, for a nice quick kill. Basically what's happening when you shoot a turkey with a shotgun, uh, yes, the BBs penetrate, but what more, most importantly what's happening is the force is snapping their neck. That's generally how they die. So if you can imagine if you shoot a bird that looks like the bottom left one and his neck is all tucked in against his body, that head has nowhere to go and nowhere to bend. Um, whereas, you know, if you shoot him like he is in the top, uh, top left picture, it has a nice, you know, full length of travel there. You're gonna be able to snap the neck real quickly with a shot. And um, it, it leads to a happy hunter and a quickly harvested bird. But now moving on to archery. So yes, headshots. Um, there are people that take headshots with archery equipment. Of course, you have to be very dialed with your equipment. Um, it works if you hit them. Um, they are very easy to miss. So if you're archery hunting and you're new to turkey hunting, I would definitely recommend at putting one through the body. So if you, again, we're starting at the top left bird, you're gonna put 
basically the arrow right through the middle of the body. You're going to disable him from flying, uh, and you're going to go through the vitals there as well. So the top right, if he's strutting and facing away, you're going to want to put that pin uh, right at where all the tail feathers meet. Again, you're going to go right through the vitals on that bird. Uh, bottom right, again, you have a straightforward shot. So this shot, if you had with a shotgun, I would not take. Uh, with a arrow, bone arrow, yes, you can take it right there at the head, or you can aim between the head and the beard and put it right through the center of the vitals as well there. And then similar with the bottom left one, uh, you're gonna just wanna put it right through the center of that bird, right through the wings, disable him from flying, and of course, hitting the vitals there. If you guys have any questions, make sure to drop that about anything regarding, uh, you know, how to shoot and uh, make sure to harvest a turning it over. Jason, we cannot hear you at the moment. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Thank goodness. All righty. Technology. All right. We're doing good. Um, thanks a lot, Adam, um, for going through all those regs. It's really important to talk about for new hunters. Um, we are going to start talking a little bit more about some land access, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some strategies to close out. Uh, real quick, Adam, just a quick favor. Can you please, in our uh, questions, someone asked for the link to the DNR website that shows your lottery uh, results. So I know we yeah. have that Facebook page. If you want to run and grab that and put that in a chat for people, if they've already put in for the lottery and they haven't checked the results yet. Um, yeah, just heads up. Cool. Awesome, man. Um, just a heads up, if you go to look at that page, it is a little uh, outdated. It's one of those pages that looks like it's from the Matrix with black background and green writing, but that is the correct page. So when you first get there, you might be like, is this the right thing? But it is. So uh, just a heads up there. Um, all right, so land access. This is arguably the hardest hurdle to conquer when being a new hunter or, or even just a current hunter. Um, so there are several ways to access land in Illinois. You have hunting preserves which is gonna be an outfitter. Then you have public land, which we'll go over the different types of public land and how to uh, get access to them. And then you also, of course, have private land and um, which is gonna be, uh, give you the most uh, access really if you have private land there. All right. So we're not really gonna talk about outfitters that much. Uh, you can Google around and find some outfitters in the state that uh, support turkey hunting and you can go and hunt on their land. Uh, get some guided hunts in there if you're new. That might be a, a avenue that you'd be interested in taking. Uh, then we also have the public land. So there's huntillinois.org. This is a new website that came out just this last fall from the IDNR. And you can use this to help narrow down your site to try to find a, a public site near you that allows turkey hunting. When you go, when you go to this page, uh, on the homepage, there is a tutorial. It's about 10 minutes long. I suggest everybody go there and watch that and it shows you all the different tools that are offered through the website. After looking at that, you can go and check out this other page that's connected to this website. It's called the Hunt Planner. So through the Hunt Planner, you can again go and find sites in the state that are offering the game that you're looking for. So in this case, I went on there and it said, where do you want to hunt? And I said, uh, everywhere. And then when it asked me, what do you want to hunt? I said, turkey and which gave me this map. So it gives you the whole list of all the sites in the state and at the very bottom gives you a map of where those sites are located at. So you can see um, some regions have much more uh, opportunities than others. So you can see in the south, there's a lot of different public land sites compared to the north, but uh, there are some near you hopefully that you're willing to drive to to try to find some turkey. So I chose uh, Green River State Wildlife Area, um, just an idea. I believe it's number 45, so it's up here, kind of closer to the north side of the state here. So with Green River State Wildlife Area, you can then look at the, the site information, similar to what was on the hunter fact sheet that Adam went over in the regulations. So this is going to be 
the new hunter fact sheet here. So these ones, you can use the same website, get the same information. It has these drop down tabs that help you go through. So you can see I, I extended out the turkey regs and then this has that site's turkey regulations. And we again, can't stress this enough to go to each of these sites that you're interested in hunting and look at the site regulations because every site in Illinois has their own regulations, including the state sites, I mean, including the state regula regulations. So anything that is uh, slightly different. Um, one key one I've seen before, it's only a handful of sites, but they actually have their shooting hours changed from 1 p.m. to noon. So that's something that's important to know before you go out to a site. So. Uh, there's only a handful of those in the state though, so um, don't worry about that one too much. But again, it's things like that uh, you need to know before going to these public sites. So the site also offers you a map. So this is a step up from uh, the traditional maps that were connected to those hunter fact sheets. Some of those were hand drawn uh, or look like an old campground map kind of. Um, these are your satellite images and you can uh, see where all the parking lots are located at. That's what all the little blue squares are. So those are all sites that you can sit there and park at at this location. And then you can see in this screen grab, I clicked on turkey, and then I'm going to highlight the spring turkey fire, firearm season. And that shows you, <coughs> pardon my cough, um, that shows you where you can hunt at. So that highlighted color is all the areas that you can hunt at in this area. Um, if again, you win the lottery to go hunt on this area uh, in the spring. So it's a very useful website. Um, so again, that's huntillinois.org. Go check that out, kind of tool around and kind of get an idea of where you want to hunt at. Uh, and another resource that is available for people to look at to see how uh, good of a site that is. Like, I, okay, I got a site near me and they offer turkey hunting, but are there even turkeys there to go scout? Well, you can go look at the public land hunting report. And this shows you past data uh, for that site and see how many turkey were taken off of there and compare that to other sites near you to kind of make a hierarchy of what sites worth your time because i personally drive 45 minutes to go hunting in central illinois and uh, i think that's almost the average for a lot of people in, in the northern section of the state uh, as well to go to these different uh, public sites so to help narrow it down uh, check this out and see how many birds are taken off of that land so here green river had 11 birds taken off uh, might not seem that much, but again, remember, there's not that many people possibly hunting it because uh, there might not be that many tags in that lottery given out. So uh, that might be a good percent, bad percent, you don't really know. Um, but it is better than other ones that you can see on this list. So you can see that that's fairly better than any other ones there besides, what's that one, Ham uh, Hamilton County? So yes, yeah, so Hamilton County had 14. And there's other ones that have much more. Um, every site's listed in this table and you can scroll through and see which ones are worth going to. There's also an IRAP program. If you're not familiar with this, uh, you should go check it out. See what locations are near you on the IRAP website. This is uh, again, another lottery, uh, but good news is if you're a first time hunter or if you're a youth hunter, you have a higher chance of winning this lottery. And this is a land access program that is ran through the state. Uh, I think this is gonna keep growing more and more because it doesn't provide make the state have to purchase the land. It allows private landowners to lease it out. And a lot of people like that a lot more than having to buy the land. So how this works is that the private landowner leases the land to public access uh, for hunting or other things like fishing. But uh, then the state gives them a conservation plan and maybe even some funding to do some management on the land and in exchange, they allow people to come use it. And this is a underused resource in the state. So it's not as cutthroat as some of those other locations where you might have 100, 100 people applying for a couple tags at each location. This one, you might actually have a chance of uh, getting a, a, a site that you picked out and wish to go to. So um, check that out and see if you're able to find a site through that program. Then we also have some private land access, uh, which 96% of Illinois is private land. Uh, and then um, you can see the breakdown there. I mean, uh, the Illinois DNR owns 1%, and then the Shawnee National Forest, which is in the southern part of the state, is almost its own, it's close to 1%. It's at 0.7% of the state. Um, something if you're interested, if all, all the, the tags get bought up and you want to try some backcountry hunting, 
um, you can get a county tag and go down to Shawnee and uh, do some backpack turkey hunting down there, which has always been on some of, I think it's been on Adam's list to try to knock out and same with Dan too. Uh, so that's an option as well. So all these um, private landowners, you can go and do some uh, door knocking, be professional and ask them if there's any way that you can get some access onto their land. And uh, you can start off with small game if they're not willing to let you go for a larger game like turkey or deer and work your way up. You can also offer to help out around the farm or do some type of um, some type of way to build a relationship with someone to allow them to let you on their land. So check that out. Um, there is a issue with liability that some people may have with letting people on their land to go hunting, but the way the law is written, as long as no money is exchanged to allow that person on your land, then they will uh, not be liable for your safety. So as long as you don't pay to go hunt there, there you have no liability on you being safe on their land. And another way to kind of help people make them feel better that uh, there's going to be no issue between the two of you. Here's a little contract that the DNR has printed out to let hunters on different people's land. So you can fill that out with the uh, landowner there to help build some confidence in, uh, in your professionalism of trying to get access to the land. Then just another tidbit for anyone who's new to walking around the woods in Illinois, uh, there is an interesting law where it's a purple paint law. So if you're walking through the woods and you start seeing these trees that all have purple paint on them, that is a property line. So that's just as uh, legally bearing as a no hunting sign or no trespassing sign. So keep that in mind as you're walking around, make sure you know where you are and uh, make sure you're, if you're on, Private land, make sure you're staying on private land. If you're on public land, make sure you're within the boundaries of that public land. Some ways to do that would be, uh, again, that th those maps that the DNR provides now with those satellite views gives you a better idea of where you are. Um, there's also some mapping apps out now, like Onyx Map and a few other map apps like that, where you can see yourself uh, with the property lines delineated on like a Google Earth layer, and you can see where you are within that. Um, and I think those are actually downloadable offline. So that way, if you're somewhere where there's no internet, you can still see yourself on that map. But again, you have to pay to get access to that. Um, there's also uh, uh, tax data on there that shows the different uh, landowners and such on those maps. So that way you know who owns what land. So that way you can find out who, um, who to go ask to get permission to hunt on those land. Uh, that information is also uh, it's called a plat map and those are you can find some of that information online or you can go down to the courthouse and, and ask to see who who owns what land in your area if you drive down the road and you see a flock of turkeys out in a cut field and you want to try to see who owns that that field uh, you can go find who, who owns that land and, and see if they are give you permission to go hunt on there all right with that um, i believe we're going to turn it over to curtis to talk about some scouting tactics All right, so scouting. Um, first thing I'm gonna talk about, you can do some e-scouting. So like Jason mentioned now, in the beautiful um, world of internet land, you can pull up Google imagery of uh, pretty much anywhere. And that makes, a, makes it a real great to, to be able to scout even without, um, even before you go out on the property yourself. Um, now, nothing beats boots on the ground scouting, and when you're talking about scouting turkeys, we're, we're not only looking for, for turkeys, but a lot of times you're talking about roosting a bird. So, um, what that means is you're looking for the uh, roost tree that that bird is using at night, um, and, and then you, you basically know where to come and find them in the morning. So. A lot of times, uh, most of the time, turkeys are going to gobble right when they fly up to that roost tree. So um, right at dusk time is a, is a good time to try to find where they're where they're using that. But you can try to find locations to sit and listen first using either, um, you know, printed out maps like this gentleman on the tailgate has or just pulling them right up on your on your computer screen.
Okay, so here we have one of these nice little pictures here. And, um, you know, this is great. We've got the ISO bars on there. So um, this is what's called a, a topo map, which is, is cool. We can see kind of the elevation changes. Uh, we can see where the fields are, where the trees are, all that kind of stuff. And we need to remember what turkeys need. Um, and they're going to be looking for those mature trees to roost. So um, you can see kind of this biggest chunk of mature woodlands here and some fields that are, are near there. That would offer you some good places to uh, go and listen and, and hopefully you can hear a, hear a gobble up there. Um, and of course they're going to be strutting out in the field. So before it gets to be um, you know evening time where the trees are flying or where the turkeys are flying up in the trees um, you can look for them strutting and displaying out in those in those fields um, okay we can and remember look for that grass that's where they're going to be feeding looking for insects and seeds Okay, so some other forms of scouting here. Right now we've got um, we got snow where you can actually find tracks. Now you're probably not going to be able to find nice tracks in the snow like that come turkey season, but I guess it's the Midwest, so um, anything can happen. But you can always look for tracks in the dusty roads, things like that. Obviously, turkeys got the big old um, Velociraptor-looking track there, so they're pretty easy to pick out. Um, as long as you're not near any water, you can be pretty sure that uh, any track like that's going to be a turkey. If you're near water, it could be a heron or something, but um, um, you can also look for scats, turkey scats. Um, the, you can find these in the fields where they're feeding, but then also underneath the roost trees, you can generally find some scats and then some feathers uh, too that are right there. Um, that can help you even find the roost trees, even if you don't hear them. Um, go on to the next slide here. And so potential roosting sites, we want to look for good mature timber that's close to open areas so they can display, strut, um, and hope to attract those hens. Um, they also like to be, be near water. Um, also, any, any wet, moist grasses are going to be great places for them to hunt for some insects. So those are, those are great. Um, and then also keep in mind that even during the spring, it can be pretty cold at night. So do keep in mind the leeward side or the pr protected side of ridges um, can offer them a little bit warmer night stay than on the windward side of the ridges. So may want to focus on those, especially if it's a, it's a bit of a cool start to the season. Okay, so when it is actually time to, to locate roost, so um, maybe you found some promising spots via uh, uh, looking at the satellite imagery. Now you actually go there and do the boots on the ground type stuff. Um, get to a good vantage point where you can see and also hear, um, and you'll need to, you know, keep in mind the conditions too, because, um, you know, if it's real windy, it's going to be real hard to hear those birds. And if it is windy or rainy, um, they don't always gobble either, which, which can make it a lot tougher. So, um, you know, it, ideally, if you have a nice, calm, uh, sunny day, that's going to be the best time to go listen. Um, and you can you can use locator calls. So uh, remember, if you're in that time where you can't use any calls that sound like a turkey to, to mine that, but you can use a call that sounds like an owl or a crow um, or even a duck or goose. Really, any, any loud noise that doesn't sound too unnatural can get the birds to, to sound off. Um, and do remember that when you do hear a bird, um, everything looks different when it's dark or when you're walking out in the morning. So when you hear a bird, if you've got your, I like to use printed out maps because uh, I'm 
yeah, I don't know, old school. I like to mark on there with a little mark where I think that bird's at. And then that allows me to plan how I can access them in the morning. It also uh, makes it so that, you know, you know where it, the way it looks like in the daytime that night, but then you come back in the morning before daylight, everything's dark. It can look really different. So it's nice to have either a, a GPS um, location you can go to or a little mark on your map so you, so you make sure you're in the right spot. And you can also plan uh, your approach and hope to not, you know, get spotted and, and bump the bird off the roost because that's one thing we haven't mentioned yet, but you do have to be careful because even once turkeys are up in the in the roost, um, a little bit of disturbance can can, you know, cause them to fly off, which obviously is going to, um, you know, has the potential to impact your hunt, but um, also impacts the turkey because now it's close to dark and um, they got to find somewhere safe, safe to be. And once it's dark, turkeys have a real hard time um, flying up in trees. So a lot of times they're going to spend that night on the ground if it's uh, too late when they get bumped out of the roost. So keep that in mind. Now, we, when, when we do find scat, you can actually generally tell the sex of the turkey just by looking at the, at the scat. And uh, we've got pictures here that'll show you. And this, this doesn't work 100% of the time, but it is something to look at. Tom scat will be a little bit bigger and um, like a big open J shape, like you see in that lower picture. Whereas the, the hen scat is gonna be much more coiled and, and clumped together. Um, so <clears throat> this works with older birds, with younger birds, it's not quite developed because really it's kind of the, the changes in their cloaca that happens once they um, have eggs that, that kind of change how those scats come out. So it's a, it's a good little thing to go by, but remember it's not 100%. And then the feathers you can identify as well. So um, we talked about when we were looking at the pictures, the, the, there's differences in not only the, the head, but differences in the body feathers as well. And here we've got some contour feathers, the breast feathers. Um, the, the male breast feather is black tipped. That's what gives them that real dark, uh, appearance rather than the, the, you know, fairly mute tones of the hens. And then to the right side there, you see that female breast feather, which is tipped in, in buffy brown. So you can actually ID the sex, even if you just find a little contour feather. All right, and so here we've kind of got an example. This is, uh, we're going to pretend that I went out and it's close to turkey season and I heard gobbles in all these spots and, and I dropped a little turkey pin in all the positions where, where turkeys were gobbling. And this is great. It, it gives me a roadmap um, to plan my hunt and not only um just the bird i'm going after but remember it's good to know where these other birds are too because when you plan your approach let's say i'm going towards this middle bird here uh, that's in the in the little corner of that stream there um, i've got to be aware of both of these other birds because if i do jump them off the roost on my way in uh, you know that has the potential to alarm the bird i'm going after too not only that but it's nice to know i've got backups in case the bird i'm after uh, doesn't come in if i wind up not jumping these other two then i've still got a chance um you know of them as well so um, now another thing we want to look at these topo maps um, turkeys are real notorious for hanging up on any little thing. So um, obviously that creek going through there, um, it, you know, if I was hunting that turkey, it would probably not be a wise idea to come up here to the northwest and park and, and to try to pull them across that stream. Um, yes, turkeys can fly, but um, and, and yes, occasionally you will call him across something like that, uh, and maybe he's going to cross that anyway. But um, 
if you have the choice, always take kind of the path of least resistance. And my guess is that turkey there right in the middle, he's probably going to fly down right in that nice protected field uh, right there in front of him to, to start strutting. So I would try to park somewhere in the middle and access that field, um, hopefully trying to stay out of sight of that bird. And then obviously giving a wide berth to the two other birds that I marked so that I don't, uh, don't jump them up either. And yep, so I was just gonna, yeah, that circled the, the one turkey that you could uh, accidentally kind of kind of jump up and, and ruin your hunt. So if you park there off that road 350 and tried to walk in, it might be might be game over. But um, here's a good little little uh, picture kind of showing that. Um, you know, walking in, it's kind of the same things you want to consider when you're walking in to deer hunt, even though you're walking in at dark and, and the turkeys are roosted, they're not being active. Um, you know, they know how delicious they are. Every, everybody wants to eat a turkey. So they're always watching for danger. Um, you need to try to conceal your approach as much as possible. So instead of walking right through the middle of the field, or instead of walking right through the middle of the woods where it's super loud, um, you know, if you've got that nice little path right along, maybe that's a field road, it's quiet walking, but you're close to the brush, which kind of conceals your, your presence, that's great. And then you also want to walk like an animal, which means instead of just, uh, people have a tendency to just put our head down and walk, and that's a very unnatural sound. Um, but if you walk for 10 or 15, you know, 30 seconds and then stop, look around, walk a little bit more. Now you're moving like an animal. And the turkeys, which can't see very well at night at all, um, even if they do detect your presence, they're gonna think you're a, a weird looking deer or a, a giant possum or, or who knows what they're gonna think you are, but hopefully something that doesn't scare them uh, too awful much. Um, and then also be thinking about your walk in, you know, the, the goal usually isn't to sit right underneath the, the tree that they're uh, roosting in because that gives you a chance where you can bust them out of there, but you're hoping to get close to them, but then, um, you know, find, get in an area that they're going to be going to, to display. So, yeah, I think we can go ahead and go to the next slide here. All right, and now <clears throat> movement corridor. So you can kind of also use the, if you know the lay of the land or the, the topography, you can kind of know where the birds are going. And this is kind of like a spot and stalk hunt, um, you know, that, uh, that people do out west. If you see the turkeys in this field, and this is a long skinny field, um, probably they're going to walk straight through it. So if you know they're getting up in that field and you were positioned somewhere down here to the south, you could potentially make a run up here to the to the far sort of western edge and, and be ready to intercept them, um, almost like a spot and stalk hunt. So um, sometimes these maps can even, even work um, on your hunt, which is pretty cool. Right, and then here's another example. So you know where the, the food is, you know where they're roosting. You can usually find out kind of um, how they're gonna get there. So, um, and there's kind of a typical picture. They're out in that grass field, which is of course the type of field turkeys love in the spring. That field's gonna be covered with grasshoppers and lots of yummy bugs to eat. Um, we know they wanna get there, um, but, if it's too exposed, meaning, you know, you see this food part up here in the, in the Northwest corner, right? There's a couple farmhouses, there's three roads. I mean, that is way, way exposed. So if they really want to strut and be displaying and, and feel safe early in the morning, rather than strutting in that area which is full of food which you know they want to be in they may utilize a little fallow field like this one that's marked here 
Um, and there may not be hardly much for food in there at all, but look at how protected it is. No roads, no houses right there. Um, that field just screams a good protected field, a great place for a Tom to, to be displaying and do his thing and, and not get disrupted by, you know, um, cars driving by or dogs barking at the farmhouse. Okay, so, um, you know, once you kind of understand where turkeys are wanting to go and, um, and where they're going, we also need to remember a lot of fields are so big, uh, you know, we've only got so much range with our shotgun. And Adam talked about it back in the shotgun slide. Um, you know, can you shoot turkeys out 45, 50 yards? I mean, yeah, that's, that's about the max. Uh, a lot of fields are a lot bigger than that. So if you can find a little pinch point or a point that's going to narrow them down, um, you know, that's going to be, um, or if there's a point of woods jutting way out into the field, now that kind of sets you out there a little bit. So even if they are about 40 or 50 yards out there, if you're already in a, in a 20 yard little jut out, then that makes them that much closer and, and hopefully within range. And the other thing you want to think about is your decoy um, and you generally want to put that beyond you so the way you think the turkeys are coming um, put that on the other side of you and and hopefully you can get that decoy out without the without the birds spotting you Right, so talking about decoys. Now, you don't have to have a decoy to turkey hunt. There's a lot of turkey hunters that, you know, never use decoys at all, um, but they can be a big help for a couple different reasons. For one, um, you know, obviously just like calling, uh, they're looking for other birds, so uh, different strategies you can use there, but also it's something to take the attention of the birds. So when they're in, hopefully it allows you to get away with just a little bit of movement so you can get your gun up and, and get ready. So decoys kind of help two ways there. But your main strategy is you're either going to make a feeding setup, um, you're going to make a walking harem, which is kind of going to be a, a bunch of hens and a big gobbler. Uh, you can have a fighting setup, which is, um, you know, good if you're going after a big old tom, but might scare away some of the um some of the uh you know younger jakes and then you could have an actual breeding setup which again could scare off some of the jakes but it's going to be um uh, actually a setup where there's a hen and a gobbler right behind them and your decoy placement can depend on the time of the year uh, what you see the turkeys doing what decoys you have obviously and then the age of the birds that you're going after on your hunting site uh, you know if you want to get a jake a fighting or a breeding setup is probably not the way to go. Just a simple feeding setup is, is probably the way to go. Um, with that, I think we'll go to the next slide. And I went into Adam's section a little bit. I apologize for that, but I'm going to turn it over to Adam for the, the feeding setup. Thanks, Curtis. Um, if you have any input, like, you know, please uh, share as well, because we can kind of just make this a discussion. Um, because I know you have plenty of turkey hunting experience as well, and you might have different views on different decoy setups uh, or any experiences. So, so um, you're welcome to chime in. But yeah, so feeding setup, uh, this is going to be the least intimidating decoy setup. Basically, what you're going to want to do is place a feeding hen turkey decoy. So head down, as you can see in this picture, uh, you could do one or two in a food plot, ag field, forest opening, or pasture. Uh, anywhere that you've seen turkeys in the past feeding, if you have been doing your scouting. Um, again, like Curtis was mentioning before, um, those nice green fields with a bunch of bugs, that's always going to be a good um, start or a good place to start uh, with a feeding setup if you're not sure of what else to do. Um, you're going to want to set a Jake decoy behind the hens if you have one. Uh, and decoy should be facing. Uh, your location, also uh, kind of a caveat there, you, you might wanna face it away from where you think uh, the tom may come as well. So there's kind of two things to think about there. 
Um, you don't always have to face them towards you, uh, but maybe you face them away from where you think that the tom would be coming from. Um, and this is a common spring occurrence and a male will want to come interrupt and challenge the jake and kind of harass the hens that are feeding. So that's kind of what you're, you're shooting for there. <clears throat> So a walking harem, as Curtis mentioned. Uh, so this is meant to look like the birds are leaving the feeding area and heading back to cover. <laughs> so this picture kind of doesn't do it justice. You'd want it to almost be turned around. You'd want the, the hen to be walking uh, towards the woods if that's where the thick cover would be. Um, and then of course the, the strutting turkey behind the hen. Um, you're gonna wanna place the, the walking hen decoy head up kind of in a walking position um facing towards the woods about 10 yards from the wood line uh place the strutting jake or or a jake decoy in pursuit again here a male will want to rush in um kind of the the boss tom in the area will want to wash in, rush in and avoid losing sight of the potential mate um and again try to get aggressive with the jake decoy um and, and try to lure the hen away from him. So that's, again, you're trying to trigger that uh, kind of testosterone reaction from the older toms. Fighting setup. Uh, so this one is super cool if you can get it to work. It's, it's uh, definitely a little bit finicky um, but if you can get this to work and see what happens, it's one of the coolest things uh, to see out in the wild, in my opinion. But basically, this is like the most aggressive setup you can have. Um, you want to use, again, the spring hormones against the gobbler, you know, against himself. Position a Tom and a Jake decoy facing each other uh, like they were trying to establish dominance of the area. Uh, if you have the decoys, you can scatter a couple of more um, hens um, or maybe another Jake or two out uh, away from them, um, but out in the setup as well. And this may scare younger birds or birds that have been beat up in the past. Um, sometimes uh, there's definitely for sure a pecking order when it comes to turkeys. You have kind of your boss, Tom. Um, that is not afraid to run in and beat up your decoys as you guys can see in the picture here. And then there are still mature uh, turkeys that have maybe gotten in one too many fights and, and are a little smarter about how they approach and they might not be uh, so aggressive to run in. Um, but if it does work, it's really cool to see uh, this picture shows, you know, one little snapshot of it, but um, they'll stand there and basically fight your decoy to death um, as long as they, you know, feel comfortable doing so. So it's kind of a wild, wild thing to see. Curtis, have you ever seen that in person? No, I had a, a coyote run up to my decoy one time and I thought he was going to tackle it, but right before he got to it, he, you know, smelled it or something and, and spooked, but no, I, I have had turkeys though, right after you shoot one and then they go and start attacking the one you shot. Yep, yep, that happens as well. So another neat thing to see during the spring, kind of a crazy occurrence, but yeah, you might get lucky and see that. So next up is the breeding setup. Again, this is an aggressive and urgent display. Uh, this position or position the submissive hen decoy directly on the ground. Uh, and place a Jake decoy immediately behind the submissive hen. Um, of course, this looks like the Jake is going to try to breed the hen, uh, which will again trigger a reaction from a, uh, another male turkey. I'm gonna try to break it up um, and face the decoys to your left or your right, wherever you anticipate the turkeys to approach. Uh, generally, an aggressive Tom will run in and try to circle the pair. And again, if you're lucky, you might see him try to beat up the decoy. Um, but yeah, so this is another aggressive tactic. So some decoy considerations. Uh, you don't need the most expensive decoys. Decoys can be spruced up by adding real feathers and fans or even beards. Uh, turkeys often hang up, as we mentioned before, just past your decoys. So place your decoys around 15 to 20 yards away 
Uh, so if they do hang up just about 20 yards behind it, you can still try to take that shot. Um, if you have a clear open area. And remember that decoys, especially Tom and Jake decoys, these days look really, really similar to, to real birds. So be safe. Um, if you have one of these kind of strutting decoys, make sure you take the fan down while you're moving. Um, don't hold it up in front of your face or anything like that. Um, you know, you don't want anybody else thinking you're an actual bird and, and getting yourself into the harm's way. So um, make sure to play it as safe as possible. Um, one more thing I want to add, if kind of, if you have a, any questions about decoys, obviously drop those in the chat. Uh, but if you're looking for one decoy to buy and you're not really sure what to do, uh, in my opinion, I would go with just buying a Jake decoy. Um, you can use that in so many different scenarios. Um, uh, Curtis and Jason, of course, I want to hear your guys' opinion as well. Uh, but kind of what I think of when I just take a Jake decoy is, um, again, you're, you're going to be able to lure in other turkeys. Hens will come to you and, you know, you'll have like your live decoys in front of you because hens won't be as intimidated sometimes. Um, you know, older males are able to come to a Jake decoy. Jakes are able to come to a Jake decoy. Uh, kind of if you, you just have a hen, sometimes a tom might hang up thinking that the hen is going to follow the tom because, of course, you're and in this, you're trying to reverse what happens in nature. Usually when a tom gobbles, the hens come and try to find the tom. Uh, when you're turkey hunting, you're trying to reverse what happens in nature. So you're trying to sound like a hen and get that tom agitated, uh, you know, because you won't be moving towards him most of the time. And he starts trying to come and find you. Uh, so if you have a tom decoy or if you have a jake de or if you have a hen decoy, uh, you know, a tom might scare him away and a hen, he might uh, hang up a little bit just because, you know, of course, he thinks that she's going to start following him. So just some things to consider. Um, and of course, if uh, Jason or Curtis have anything to add to that, um, please do so. No, I think, <clears throat> think that was pretty good. We did have uh, one question about, um, you know, what's the, what's the best course of action if the turkeys are like moving away from you and, and not, um, you know, basically being responsive to your calling. And so I'll go ahead and say, say my way. And then, um, you know, maybe Adam or Jason's got something to add too, but uh, you know, this happens sometimes. Some turkeys are like not callable um, when they get hinned up. There's a couple different tactics I do. One, one tactic is to try to really piss off the hens. So if the gobbler is not, you know, not being re receptive, um, if you can really make the boss hen angry um, and, you know, she wants to scrap with you, sometimes you can call her in and then the whole group kind of follows. But, you know, and it also depends on how much time you got left. I remember one time me and a buddy were hunting. We got uh, this place to hunt that we knew had birds. And, um, you know, we were so excited we were going to double up. I was back in college. We go to hunt. They acted like they could not hear us at all. I mean, we did not exist. Day two, same thing. So all we did was just kind of watch that they they flew into this safe field where they could strut and feed and slowly walk across. And um, so on the third day, we just kind of left the calls at home. I mean, that's an exaggeration. We brought them, but we never touched them. And we just sat at the edge of this field where a uh, pinch point where we knew they were likely to walk by. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most uncomfortable turkey hunts ever because we we sat right on the edge of the field and the turkeys were in this field for like, you know, two and a half hours before they got to us in, you know, within shooting range. So we had to sit completely still motionless for two and a half hours. And, and you know, that felt like... I mean, you could have told me it was 12 hours and I probably would have believed you at the time. Um, but yeah, we finally did get them up, never touching. And it was just kind of like a, a deer hunt. So we scouted them. We knew where they were going to go and we just got in their way. It wasn't quite as fun, wasn't quite as interactive as a lot of turkey hunts, but we did get them right in and I got mine. My my buddy Luke missed his, but um, 
you know, you'll have to ask him about that one. Um, <laughs> but we sat there for so long. I remember when I stood up, both of my legs were completely asleep and I just had to like sit back down until I like re regain blood flow to my feet so I could walk out here to this bird. But anyway, that's, that's kind of my tactics. I don't know if you got anything to add to that, Adam or Jason. Yeah, basically the thing that comes to mind is patience. I mean, like you just said, there's so many different ways to, you, you just explained it like you were kind of deer hunting the turkeys. There's so many ways to hunt turkeys. If one thing doesn't work one day, um, you know, maybe the next day, try try the same thing quickly because it, you know, like you said, it might turn on that day. If again, if that's not working, switch to a totally different plan um, and just, it, it's fun in the way that you can, kind of devise plans so many different ways to, to kill a turkey it's really uh, a challenge and kind of a chess match and it can change like you said day to day uh, but biggest thing is stay patient and if you do plan on moving on the birds let's say they're walking away before you move make sure they're out of sight and they cannot see you that's another thing to pay attention to because their eyes are super good and any odd movement you're going to spook them scare them away so if you plan on circling around them or anything like that uh, make sure they don't have a direct line of sight with you anymore before you move. But yeah, other than that, just stay patient and, and keep trying. And eventually, like like Curtis just said, you're going to learn what they do and, and hopefully, you know, kind of intercept them in a way that you're going to be able to get a shot. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think you guys said pretty much the gist of it right there. And um, if you're interested in learning more tactics and stuff, we have Turkey Hunting 102 coming up on Thursday, where we will go through different scenarios and things and show maps and give you ideas of other ways to uh, make plans, just like Adam said, of different scenarios and how to try to go about uh, different ways that turkeys could respond to your calling or not respond to your calling. So join us on Thursday. Uh, and then real quick, so this is the end of our webinar here. Um, so we're just going to sum up a little bit, but and also highlight this uh, National Wild Turkey Federation. Uh, there are different species, there's hunting groups for different species. There's also some universal hunting groups you can be a part of. Uh, the leader for turkey right now, for sure, is gonna be the National Wild Turkey Federation. Uh, if you haven't looked into them at all, please do. Uh, they have a lot of different uh, fundraisers and things to help them raise funds to help save the habitat and um, help just like how the turkey has been a a huge success, success story. They've been a part of that for sure. So look into them, look into the different chapters across the states and um, follow them on Facebook to see if they're having any fundraisers near you or any events near you. Uh, COVID has really impacted a lot of these hunting groups, uh, be it Pheasants Forever or uh, the, the NWTF um, and other groups that have banquets and things throughout the year that help them with their fundraising. So a lot of them had to move online for fundraising, so we have their fund. They have their fundraisers here. So they had uh, their conference is actually being held this week. Um, so if you're not a member and didn't know about that, they are having their conference this week. And this is a again a virtual conference that they're holding. So you can register for that. Just go to conference.nwtf.org/en. So follow along there to see what they're up to this year. Um, this is a link to a fundraiser that they were having and they had an online auction as well that went along with this conference that they're having this week. Um, all kinds of things that they have auctioning off. Uh, plenty of shotguns and other things and just the general equipment that you can go on there and do some auctioning and things like that. So it's good to support these groups because they do do a lot for uh, helping out the different habitat and, and things like that for sure and uh, making sure that hunters don't uh, go extinct themselves. So uh, we did not cover turkey calling this time. Uh, our past 101 courses, we would have talked about calls and um, some vocalizations that the turkeys make, but we have broken that off just to, for time and to go more deep into detail with it. So if you guys were with us last week and joined us for the turkey calling 101 course, that's great. Um, we have the link here. Uh, I think I have it still on my clipboard here. I can probably put that in a chat. Let's see here. Come on, chat. Come on here. Yeah, so hold on. There you go. So I put the link in the chat. So this is just on our YouTube page. 
Um, if you weren't with us for the Turkey Calling 101 um, and you want to learn more about turkey calling and turkey vocalizations, please do that. Um, and it's on YouTube. It's public right now, so you can go and check that out. And then again, uh, Turkey Hunting 102 is going to be on Thursday at 5 p.m. So join us for that. And we will be covering a lot more scenarios. We won't be talking about regulations or anything like that at all. So that leaves us a lot more time to go over scenarios and uh, things like that to help you become a better hunter um, instead of just a legal hunter. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about shed hunting and tactics on February 23rd. Then we're going to be doing a turkey hunting Q&A. So if you have any other questions after turkey calling and turkey 101 and turkey 102, now is the time to ask them in turkey hunting Q&A. So that's going to be held on February 25th. So think of your questions. Um, you can ask us um, and you can email them to us. That way we know them ahead of time. We can, if it's a really specific question, we can get on the turkey biologists and talk to them and see what they're doing as well. Uh, so um, then we're going to be doing a shotgun overview. So if you're brand new to hunting and you don't know that much about shotguns, we'll be talking about shotguns and shotgun types, shotgun cleaning, everything shotgun uh, on March 2nd. Okay, so that's going to be our webinars there. And then come March, we will be making up another list of webinars that we'd be giving out in March. And the best way to keep an eye on that is to join us on Facebook and our website. And you can register for those just as you registered for this one. Please also join us on Instagram and our YouTube channel, which we are building out currently and trying to make more instructional videos and informational videos for the YouTube channel. So trying to do all this stuff online uh, with the COVID restrictions, hopefully in the end of summer, somewhere around there, these vaccines are the light at the end of the tunnel and get back to doing workshops because that's what this program was founded on. So if you found us through this COVID era, and didn't know what we were before this, um, we were workshops. So we, we provided free hands-on adult classes uh, across the state and you can come out and actually shoot shotguns and shoot bows and arrows and, and uh, learn how to clean a goose. So please join us when we get back into those uh, and follow us on our, our websites there. Um, so thank you. And if you have any questions, you can ask, uh, ask us here now during the Q&A. All right, if we don't have any questions, then you guys can have a great night. And we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.